All right, so we are. Uh, this is the the features presentation. Hopefully, that's what everybody is expecting to find when they get in here. Uh, the idea is making features work for you. So features is a uh, is actually a really is a the screen's not even working. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, my presentation was really just there so that I know where I'm supposed to be. That's, you yeah, I'm recording right now, so this will be saved for posterity. So I guess we'll wait for a few more minutes here as the uh, thing turns on here. If you could just let me know when it's when you can see it because I can't see the screen at all. Is it good to go? Warming up? Awesome. All right, so like I said, this is features, making features work for you. Um, the, uh, the idea is features in Drupal development is a, you know, re a really great advancement that's happened. However, features itself is kind of full of broken promises. So we're going to try and get it around how to, how to work with it and how to make it work well for you. So my name is Frank. I'm a uh, Drupal developer over at KWall. And uh, on Drupal.org and IRC, you'll find me on there with the handle of FROB, F-R-O-B. And I'm the maintainer for the uh, Drupal for Firebug module, Google Analytics Event Tracker, Google Analytics Lite for Drupal 8 and uh, pretty much all of the uh, KWAL branded Drupal.org modules. Uh, KWAL, we're considered a no limits interactive agency. Basically, you know, do not tell us that it can't be done. So big pizza box, little refrigerator, we'll make it work. So these are the kind of the, the issues that you run into when you're doing Drupal development. So you know, you've got so your configuration stored in the database. So any changes that you need to make, the uh, you know, it, these aren't things that, that happen in code. It's not an MDC framework or like Ruby on Rails or anything like that where you make your changes in code and it's, uh, yeah, and it, yeah, it'll build your database around it. But this is the configurations are in the database. You have to make an installation, it has to work. And uh, yeah, moving from one thing to the other, the database is not stored in any type of repository. So that configuration is then not stored in a repository. So this comes into issue, really, if you've got multiple devs working in multiple environments. If you're a single person working on a single thing and you've got your database as your, for your configuration, that's not really a problem. But if you've got multiple people all trying to do multiple things in multiple places, then you really come into a big issue when you try to bring that stuff together. And you also end up usually with a lot of duplication of work. So you build this thing out, it works great on your uh, local environment. Well, you can't really package that stuff up, send it up without destroying somebody else's work if everything's in the database. So you've got to redo all, everything that you did in some other central source. So you end up having to do everything that you do twice. And you know, duplication of work, anytime you have duplication of work, you end up with very big problems as far as the uh, it's error prone and also who wants to do the same thing multiple times to just like grind out a site that's not good for anybody. So there are a lot of solutions out there that don't work. So backup and migrate, it's, you know, it was originally kind of designed as a, you know, you can use this and keep your databases in sync, but it doesn't really do that. Uh, backup and migrate is really good for really one thing, incremental backups of a database. So yeah, you can set up cron jobs and do everything just to keep your database backed up. Automatic backups works great. Doing the work twice. Technically, this works most of the time, but nobody really, it's, it's not really a solution. So that's, yeah, nobody wants to do the thing, uh, do it twice. Custom code, again, works. It gets very complicated. Most of the, uh, almost everything that you want to do, and I should say, Everything that you can do in the Drupal UI can be done in code, or else you wouldn't be able to do it in the UI. So these, uh, so you can write your own custom deployments and your own custom everything that will put all this stuff and do it all in code and keep all this stuff uh, in your database, but 
managing all of that becomes very complicated, especially when you've got, uh, yeah, and it's really something that if you're a Drupal developer, in order to utilize these APIs, you're basically a senior Drupal developer, which means you're not necessarily the one who you want to, you know, give out the task of site building to. So here, junior developer, site build, package in a feature, and it'll work. There's another the configuration module. Configuration module was a great idea. It basically was a, a backport of the Drupal 8's configuration management system to Drupal 7. It doesn't really work well because one of the reasons why all this stuff works in Drupal 8 is because of the architecture that Drupal 8 is in. So this module is out there. It was a good kind of like proof of concept. It, you know, originally, you know, it was kind of a a way of doing it without getting into features because features has issues and uh, but it's not really uh, it's not really used necessarily. And then there's the solution that works, which is features. Features does work. It can have issues, but it does actually work. It uh, it takes those things. It's a uh, the systems that they have in place. Uh, can be uh, can be built, but just like pretty much everything in Drupal, in order to make it work, you have to know how to make it work. Does that make sense? So, what is features? So, features is uh, oh, there's supposed to be another thing in there. Anyways, features is a uh, is a way to export configuration as code. It's uh, basically a uh, a user interface. Uh, in both Drush and in the uh, admin, admin side of things that makes it so that you can export core pieces of configuration as code. So what Features does, there it is, it, uh, it has an API that also allows other modules to, uh, to provide a central interface for exportables. So if you've got, uh, if you've got your own module, you can utilize Ctools exportables, and features will work with that. And uh, then you can utilize features on built-in APIs to also export other things as well, things that aren't necessarily a Ctools exportable, you know, compatible thing. So there's uh, and what C, uh, what features itself tries to do is take all of the pieces of configuration that Core can uh, like kind of provides. And it tries to give you a an ability to export that as uh, as the code that would be used for that in the uh, in the initial uh, yeah if you were to be writing the code yourself. So basically, just what I said. Awesome. So this is what features does not do, though. Uh, at least out of the box, features doesn't do any of this stuff. Content uh, features out of the box doesn't use uh, doesn't work with content. So um, there are modules out there that help you to stage your content using features. I do not recommend doing this. This is a bad idea. If you're, if this is what you're trying to pull off, rethink things. There's, uh, there's an issue there. Variables, again, not out of the box. There's a strong arm module. Strong arm will allow features to export var uh, variables. Now, variables are things that uh, Drupal saves in the variables table. The API interface would be variable set and variable get. And if you've got, uh, if you're, uh, you can export these things into features and uh, keep them in sync that way, and it works pretty well if you're using Strongarm, but it doesn't do it out of the box. Taxonomy. You can do vocabularies, you can't do terms. Terms are considered content. So uh, there are, again, extra uh, features modules that you can use to do taxonomy terms. Your mileage may vary. Uh, mainly, a uh, big issue there is if you're doing that, and uh, you have to really be confident that your taxonomy terms that there are none <clears throat> being created over in uh, on the Drupal site. So, if you're expecting features to manage your taxonomy, it's the only thing that can manage your taxonomy because you want to keep those TIDs. That's a whole point: is keeping your TIDs in check so that you can utilize taxonomy terms back and forth. Blocks out of the box. Blocks are nearly impossible to uh, to configure with deployments. Uh, again, blocks are a mixture of contents and configuration. You've got uh, core blocks that can be put out there, and uh, there is the blocks info hook that you can use to try to set those things, or you can use, uh, do what most no, uh, normal, more sane people do of uh, you know, actually using a SQL query to just say, put this block where I want it to be and, you know, and update this, uh, this you know, thing in the blocks table. Um, again, 
if you're using a SQL query, you're not using an API, and that's an issue. The reason you're not using an API for blocks is because blocks API sucks. Yeah? I'm getting to that. Yes. So again, not out of the box. There is, uh, there are, uh, there's Bean and boxes which allow you to sort of export your uh, your, your uh, configuration of blocks into uh, into features. Now, uh, boxes uh, was the uh, boxes is kind of like was uh, think of it as like the Spark representation for like the, a lot of the user interface uh, stuff that they were doing for content editors for Drupal. A. Boxes was that with the blocks. So let's get you know, let's get a good user interface and a good developer interface around uh, around making uh, blocks entities. That was what boxes did, and pre uh, sort of the precursor to that was a bean, which was blocks are uh, what is it? I think it's blocks are not en uh, nodes or something along the. Uh, but block entities aren't nodes. That's it. Bean is uh, kind of the anti-node blocks uh, solution. So. Um, it allows you to make block entities and you know, configure these things a bit, but it's still you know, features. You need another module basically to do that. Users can't do uh, can't export users again. This is a uh, another module will allow you to do that with features. Like I was saying, features has a very extensible API. You can do lots of things with it that maybe you shouldn't do, such as users. And the other thing that features doesn't do is export the settings for the key feature, the most important contributed module of your largest project. So that thing that you really, really depend on features to do, it will not do that. Do not rely that features can do those things, uh, the things that your site relies on. Don't just expect it to do it. Try it, but expect it to fail, because features does that. Features fails on you all the time. So just want to make sure that that's out there. It's a solution. It does work, but it will fail. So this is kind of the anatomy of a feature. So we know what features is. We know what features does. This is more of that, you know, what does features use to do these things? So the first thing features does is it exports this stuff as a module, so it needs an info, uh, an info, you know, dot info mod, uh, file. So here you've got the example base uh, module that I'm just kind of using. In here you've got your dependencies that it will uh, try to auto detect for you. Then in here you have the features in the uh, in the info hook, and what this will do is it kind of gives uh, features. It tells features what to do basically. So in here it has the the field bases. I put this dot 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 in here because your info uh, dot info file will be much bigger than this. It'll be very very long with lots and lots of dependencies and lots and lots of uh, you know they're called feature components listed here. So all of the components that are in your feature will be listed in this dot info file. So as you can see here, field base, field instances, you know, your input filters, all that stuff. Then you've got your star.features.inc. And this is where features really does its business. It's the, um, so you've got your, your hooks that features is implementing. So here's your node base dot, in, uh, you know, underscore info. So it goes through and it'll kind of get all this stuff. It, what it attempts to do is implements the actual Drupal, uh, Drupal APIs and everything it does. So um, yeah, so yeah, that's basically that. And uh, the dot features uh, dot ink is where it initializes this stuff. On oh, the text, Did that work it doesn't look like it's working. That's that looks. I hope that's better. That's as zoomed in as it's going to get. Um, so here we've got uh, the uh, star.features.star.inc. This is where any module that uh, features relies on to do its business is doing its business. So module specific stuff. So in here, the user roles, for instance, that's something that is exp uh, that is exporting with uh, with users. So it's going to be putting the very specific component related stuff into these modules. So features organization, this is kind of the way that you would necessarily want to organize your feature. Of course, all of this stuff is uh, is more uh, subjective than objective. So you kind of, uh, yeah, you kind of, your mileage may, may vary and you want to really get used to something like this that you're familiar with. So uh, custom themes would generally go in your site's uh, star, you know, site's star themes custom, custom modules, site's star modules custom, and features, site star modules custom features. Because remember, features are uh, features themselves are modules, so you know, and almost always you're going to be working with uh, custom 
features. So it makes sense to kind of put them, excuse me, put them into this uh, sort of naming convention. Speaking of features, naming conventions. Now, name it for what it does, but be mindful of naming conventions. Be very mindful of naming conventions, and not just inside of your Drupal project, but on Drupal.org as well. Because your module, uh, you know, features is a module. It, Drupal will think, oh, look, I have this module installed. Let me see if there are any new updates for this module. And it'll bug you about module updates that don't exist because you have a, mo a feature that's named the same as a Drupal.org module. So one way to get around this is to utilize a, uh, you know, utilize a, you know, a, um, like a prefix. I personally don't like that solution because it just, it's just more to type. But it does work. So, you know, so if you've got a, a site for, you know, you know, if it's your example sites, put, you know, example underscore feature name. You know, it's just, it'll help you, uh, you know, kind of in the long run. And then ignore, organize your features. Be mindful of the organization of your features. I'm going to go into this really before I show you and how to build the features because this is uh, very, uh, very important. Remember, features is very, very dumb. Very dumb has no idea what it's doing until you tell it what to do so the uh, you know, so you can't trust that it knows really what it's doing it'll make suggestions to you such as dependencies and uh, oh I know that I'm using this content type so I'm going to need these fields and stuff like that but check everything that features tells you to do every single thing because there are certain things that features will do that if you actually put that in your feature you enable it and you try to deploy will give you serious consequences with your database the uh, the other thing is when you build a feature, back up your uh, back up your database, build the feature, enable the feature. Do not make more than one feature at a time, one at a time. Back up between each one because those backups will be necessary if everything goes to hell, and it will. So the uh, and you need to make sure that you enable your features. Enabling your features makes features aware. That there, are other feature, uh, that there are other features or modules enabled on the system that need, it needs to have as a dependency. So, if you, uh, so kind of the idea behind organizing, uh, organizing your features, there's several different mindsets. One, uh, the one that I personally utilize is you have, the, uh, you have your feature that's like the site feature. You put all of your, uh, you'd put your field bases into that for whatever, you know, I usually will say, okay, page content type. Everything is going to have a page content type. This is the site feature. It'll have the page that'll have the uh, the base uh, the field bases for everything that's in page, and everything uh, all the features after that will depend on that feature. So it kind of builds that dependency tree up to it. So you have your dependency tree that will chain things out. Another uh, another idea is to have your uh, have your features. Here's my field bases feature. All of my field bases go into this feature, and nothing else goes into this feature, which works very well. And then your, in, uh, your individual content type features after that will then only have field instances in them. This, uh, this does work very well. It's not as, uh, it's not as uh, granular or modular as the way that I prefer to do it, because uh, so what it ends up doing is if you do end up having a site that you want to turn features off with, those field bases are basically there forever because it's in that field bases uh, feature. So, you know, be mindful of that. If you've got a site that's going to have lots of things turned on and off, multi-sites where features are going to be spread across all of them, it might be better to switch to a solution where you have more of a dependency, uh, uh, more dependency on your features internally so that you have field bases kind of spread out amongst the modules that are actually using them. But uh, yeah, here's the, th uh, the issue comes to, you can't have two features with the same field base. They will conflict, and you'll have nothing but problems. And so you need to be very mindful of that. And so um, things that you really need to make sure that you manually go in and check. Field groups. Always manually check your field groups. Ne don't rely that features will know what your field groups are. And then check your field instances inside those field groups. Contrib entity settings. Uh, the unfortunate thing is for field uh, for field settings inside of entity uh, inside of entities such as auto no title um, things like uh, things of that nature. You can't trust that that stuff is being stored anywhere because every module developer puts that stuff wherever they want to. 
They don't necessarily, you know, implement APIs the way that Drupal tells them to, and you can't trust that they do. So, uh, do so. So, I mean, build your feature, test it. If it's in there, awesome. It means that the person's using the APIs the way that they're necessarily that they're expected to. If it's not in there, you're going to need to take a look at that module, find out where it puts it in its code, and see what it's doing. Typically, it'll end up being in a uh, in like a variable somewhere. So, you're going to need to use strong arm to bring those in. So here's the how to use features, uh, basically using the API. The feature process, like I said before, back up, commit those changes, ex like any changes that you have in there, make sure that that's committed. Export your feature, commit it again, Com you know, get, uh, get it in there, commit it to your SVN or your uh, Git or wherever. Enable that feature. Test that feature. Make sure that it works. Don't just enable it on that site and make sure that it's working because it'll just say it's working because it was working before. Bring that feature into another uh, to a test deployment. Bring it back up and make sure that all your stuff is there. If your stuff isn't there, then you know that you need to re uh, you know re-export the feature and test it again. And if it uh, and then repeat because it probably won't work the first time because it's features. All right, so this is where I was planning on going into the uh, into this. So this will be the uh, kind of your static Drupal seven installation. Features are under structure, and you've got your features. Out of the box, you'll have whatever features uh, in he it will be listed here. Whatever modules that you have that they give you, lots of modules give you features out of the box that you'll never use. A lot of those will say things like conflicting and stuff like that, or unmet dependencies. You need all this stuff in order for this feature to work. You don't have to worry about any of that because if you never enable that feature, don't worry about these red flags. Um, so one of the features that will almost always have con uh, conflictions in it is called the is from the isotope module, where it's isotope example. An isotope example has some very generic thing like news They've called it like a uh, like a field news or something along those lines, and it will conflict with every single thing that you ever try to do. So you know, just keep that in mind. Some errors you can just ignore because this thing's not enabled. So to create a feature, so I create this feature. Very simple uh, user interface. This is the uh, the features two. If we're using features one. Update uh, update your features. Updates your exported features, and you know get out of features one land because features one it has some very serious issues. Um, so your package, this would be your package on Drupal.org. So if I was to uh, come over here to modules and open this up, see cores as a package, administration is a package, chaos tool suite is a package. So your, uh, this is what that package is. Like I said before, features are modules, so everything really equates to a module when you're uh, going through. Version, I normally don't put a version number in until I start writing update hooks for a feature. So if I have uh, something in a feature that needs to update itself, then I'll start with a, uh, I'll start putting a version number in there. And the reason for that is it doesn't matter, so why type extra things? So there's that. So here's a list of your components. So let's say I wanted to create a content type feature for my basic page. So what it'll do is it'll attempt to say, hey, you need all of these things for your uh, basic page. Now, one of the things that you'll notice here that you don't necessarily need is organic groups UI. You can uncheck that, and you can uncheck your uh, these kind of custom dependencies, uh, these like automated dependencies as you go through. You can also set in your uh, uh, set in your feature uh, like under the features list there to ignore certain dependencies in the uh, features.info file that's uh, that is generated. Then you have uh, yeah you can put other things into uh, into it so let's yeah just say a view of con OG contents and yeah you know, there's so you can go through and you build out your feature. And now it used to be you just had to download your feature at this point. So uh, with features two, you've got a great uh, a great piece here, such as path to generated feature module. So what this gives you is the uh, you can set in here. So uh, by default, it just goes into sites all modules features because when features was originally designed and developed, they were thinking, oh, everybody's just going to start releasing features and everybody yeah, will be use you know whoever built this blogs feature or news article feature or all these other things and everybody will be happy. 
features never really worked that way. That's one of those broken promise things I was talking about. So you need to make sure that uh, so you know you don't necessarily want to follow the uh, the prescribed defaults for things. We normally would go to sites all modules custom features. Once you put that in and you generate your feature, that'll be in the .info file, and it, you won't have to type it in every time. And so here's the other awesome thing that you can do. Generate feature. So this will generate the feature in this path here for us. So we don't have to, uh, so that you don't have to download the feature from this download feature button. Take that downloaded feature and upload it to your web server and fix the permissions because it's no longer owned by www data. It's now owned by whatever your user, uh, you know, is on your, uh, on your server. So, you know, you don't have to fix your permissions after that. You can just tell it to generate it and the web server will generate this for you, which is awesome. The other cool thing that this will do for you is preview.info file. So, oh, I have to give it a name. So if you do that, you'll see here that you have a .info file that you can uh, preview. And this is also handy if, for instance, you can't generate a feature on the server. So you can at least have the .info file in there. The, uh, now, uh, I'll get into this in a second, but like I said, the .info file records all of the components that are in your feature. So if you're, uh, so all you really need to generate a new feature is your .info file. You do that and you tell features to regenerate. You don't have to go through here every single time and check all these boxes. And some features can be huge, so you don't want to have to go through here and check all these boxes. Another thing to just keep in mind, um, I don't have uh, strong arm enabled on this, but so certain things Drupal core uh, yeah, doesn't really give you an interface for, uh, for new content types, it's things like comments. So comments are stored in a variable on the variable table. So you need strongarm to export your comment settings for various content types. So if you want to have a content type such as page that you don't necessarily want comments enabled on, then you can uh, you need that in order to put the uh, the comment uh, in order to really take the comments off of content types. So, any questions on the user interface? Yes. You mentioned field base. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Thank you for reminding me about that. So here you've got field bases and field instances. So the body field is one of those field bases that you want to generate in your first uh, in one feature and will always mess you up if you don't do that. If you have two uh, because every content type almost will have a field body. Another thing is if you use something like title field, then your title field base will want to be in every uh, in every feature unless you separate your field bases or you create that dependency by enabling your features. So you've got be, uh, body here and then you've got uh, node field body. Now the idea behind this is if you edit a content type, you notice at the bottom of that edit screen, there's these are the global things that affect all content types. Those are the things that affect the database and those are the things that are in the field base. So if your field base is set to uh, cardinality of one or a cardinality of unlimited, these things uh, really matter and that's where this stuff gets stored. So your field instance is just where that uh, field base is attached to your bundle or your whatever content type that you have. So you've got entity, bundle, and the bundle is where the field instance goes and the field base is how it's really stored in the database. Is that clear? Yeah, awesome. All right, so now these are some of the more advanced uh, features stuff here. So the uh, there's several different uh, things that you uh, that you need to do. So there's features revert, features update, and kind of their uh, their cousins, uh, uh, FRA and FUA. So these are basically the same as above, but it affects all of the features on your site. So if you want to revert a single feature. FR, feature name, and, 
on that you can also pass in the components so you could uh, so you can revert a single component of a feature so if you really mess things up and you're doing site building or anything like that you can revert that feature and get back to the way that it was as it is in code uh, features update. If you've made a bunch of changes to uh, to something in your configuration on your database and you need to get that into code, features update reads that info file and it'll take that uh, take all that stuff um, and it'll generate it as the uh, you know in the code. It'll generate those star dot features dot ink and star dot features dot star dot ink uh, files I was showing you. So these are the uh, the the real big things here. Let me see if I bring it up here. Oops, wrong one. Um, so if I do address shuffle, so it'll list out my features there. And this is another really cool, uh, really good thing to drush pipe, yeah, grip features. You know, list out all the features commands, and you can do that with anything in Drush. So these are. These are the Drush features commands, and here's the uh, the thing: is if you're going to get really serious about features, you really need to learn the uh, the Drush commands for them, the uh, Drupal shell. And one of the cool reasons why is because then you can start scripting out deployments and things of that nature, so that you can say, "Hey, Drush fra dash y, revert all the features." Or if you've got a massive multi-site and you're working on one of those and you need to deliver that out to all hundred sites in that multi-site, you can do drush at sites fra dash y and it'll update all of the features on all your hundred sites one at a time. So it's, it comes in very handy to know the drush commands for it and it, uh, it helps you along with your deployments as well. So the other thing to remember is uh, this is how, you know, this is what it is. Features builds a module, uh, or builds a feature, looks at the info file, generates all those components in code, and then you profit sometimes. So the cool advanced thing to remember about that is rather than going through the Drush interface, and uh, because you can add components to your feature through Drush, it's just a very monotonous, long process of you going through lists and lists of of uh, you know command line uh, code to add components to it. Instead of doing that, you can generate your feature. Look at that info file that uh, that it would generate for you. Instead of generate uh, instead of generating the whole feature, just take that line from the uh, from your info file, put it in your own .info file. Tell it to re uh, to regenerate the feature if you're adding components. Much quicker way of doing it is just to add this stuff to the info file uh, manually rather than telling it to like regenerate the whole thing through the user interface. Because that user interface is a bit of a bear and has uh, is also pretty resource intensive. So to kind of go into a little bit more of the advanced stuff in the features uh, user interfaces over here in the features settings. Like I said, features is a huge bear. And one of the reasons is because it goes through and it looks for all of those components every time you want to generate a feature. So what you can do in here, these are the components that it shows when you tell it to create or edit a feature. And you can turn these things off. So if you turn this off this stuff, say field bases, never show field bases in my, uh, in my component list, which means you cannot and, uh, add field bases to your, uh, to your features if you do this. And you save that configuration. When you go back to create a feature, you'll notice that the only thing that's here is the stuff that was still checked. So you uh, so you can really limit this down. So if you've got a so if you start running into issues where you're running out of memory showing all of the different components that you can uh, that you can do, and you don't necessarily want or are able to go in there and start adding things to say your settings.php file to increase the memory just for when you're on this page. You can just limit the things that are being shown here on this component screen. It'll take a lot less memory to show this page to kind of streamline your user interface. Another uh, thing that you can do is down here, lock components. So you can lock these components. Uh, and this isn't just not showing them. That means that these things won't be exported at all. Like, so you can lock these things down and say, nobody's able to do the uh, stuff with these things. And then here you... Uh, here you have the uh, general settings, which are very important. So remember I said I always update this. So sites all modules, you can tell it the, uh, the default setting to put your features in will always be whatever uh, will be whatever you put in here. So this is your uh, how you set that default. 
And then this is the last one right here. Rebuild features on cache clear. On production, always turn that off. Because on production, you should never be rebuilding your features you know, until you're ready to export the, pe the features with whatever really quick fix that you had to do on live. So, uh, and what this does is it really bogs down your cache clears. So if you ha uh, when you do have cache clear ma uh, normally or manually in Drupal, what uh, you know, this will uh, keep your system from going through your whole, all your list of features and trying to say, okay, what's changed in all these features? Because that's what it's doing all the time. Every time your cache clears, if you if that's checked, it'll constantly try to do uh, to redo this. So if you've got, say, your cache is set to uh, you know to clear every you know every five minutes or ten minutes or hour or whatever, every time that's uh, the cache clears in this, whoever uh, whatever poor sap visits your site before you know before the cache rebuilds is going to end up with like a minute page load if this thing is uh, is set up so it's you know and it has nothing to do with what's on their uh, what's on their screen what's being rendered yes what, what is the benefit of not No, it rebuilds when you view the uh, the features page. You mean what would the benefit of having that right. set? I don't know. It, it's features. You can't always understand why they did certain things. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They start complaining about performance. You just go in there, uncheck that box, and all of a sudden performance is much better. And it'll be like, wow, that's awesome. So the, uh, I guess one of the, the benefits would be that if you come in here and you do the, you know, the Drush FL and it gives you the list of features, this doesn't rebuild your features when you do the Drush commands. So you would have to come in here and, you know, clear the cache and get that stuff done specifically if you're, uh, if you're doing a lot of this. But again, it's all development. There's no reason to have it enabled on production. And it's enabled by default. So always remember... If, you've, if you're running features and you didn't know about that setting, that's happening on your sites now. So, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, <laughs> so I'll, I'll get to a little bit of that in just a second. So a feature has a uh, override and status if something's changed. So if you change something and you, and I come back over here to this, you'll see the states. The state will say overridden if I change something that that feature would have in it. It only happens if the if the uh, if the status is enabled. So if the, the feature has to be enabled for it to, to know that. And if you're uh, on dev and and kind of on uh, on live, I uh, I will typically have this as, uh, enabled as well as the diff module. If you're using features, you should probably have diff enabled because what diff does is. Over here in your feature, if you've got a feature that's uh, that's already created and you've got uh, and you've got it in here, and you're just, you're looking at oh these are the things that it's marking as overridden. Well, what's overridden in that? If you have a diff installed, it'll say these are the specific things that are uh, that are generated in this feature that are overridden. So what it'll do is it will generate your feature like temporarily. And it'll take that and it'll diff it against the code of the feature that's currently enabled on the sites, and it'll tell you what different lines of this feature uh, of that info file is diff uh, has changed. So what are these changes on these different things? That, uh, and it's not just the info file; it's all the files. But it'll, it'll tell you what are the different pieces that uh, that have been changed, have been overridden, so that you can make a better uh, change. If you're not the only one working on this, or if you've got a client who likes to make a lot of changes to their stuff kind of on their own then you can go in and you can say, okay, I'm re putting out a new release. This feature has changed. What's changed on this feature? And put it out there and take a look and see what, is, uh, what has actually changed. And always remember, features is a module. And this is, uh, that means that it has a dot module file. And in that dot module file, you can do all the stuff that you want to do. But not only does it have a dot module file, it can have a dot install file, which means you can have update hooks. So have update hooks. Deploy your stuff out there. Do things. Uh, so if you're going to come out and do the next thing, in your next deployment, put an update hook in there that does exactly what he's talking about of turn off that, feed, uh, turn off that setting in features. 
because then you won't have to deal with it. You know, that's you just put that into you know into either your custom modules or your update hooks that it'll just turn that off for you. And this is a, a piece, a little code snippet that we uh, that we use, and that is if you're prefixing your features, you can put this in your custom module, uh, whatever your custom code module is, and this will take anything that's being uh, that's in your uh, that has a prefix on it and take it out of that update check. So if you're not uh, doing this, you know, my next se session is about not updating your modules and not updating core. So I'll go into this a little bit more in depth in that session, but yeah, uh, definitely go to that because it's the most important talk at Drupal Camp this year. Um, the, uh, so what this will do is anything that's prefixed with that prefix in the uh, in that module uh, or that's a module on your site, it'll take it out of the the check for it, so that you can take uh, so that you can tell it not to check things, or else you'll end up with issues where you've got a feature that has the same name as a Drupal.org module. That Drupal.org module has an update for it, you know, it's it, because it actually has a uh, you know a version number, let's say. And its version number, it says, is higher than the one that you have currently as your feature. They're completely unrelated things. You just happen to have a namespace collision with a Drupal.org module. So what will end up happening is if you try to do an automated update of your sites, Drupal will say, hey, I noticed that, that's, uh, that your feature that, looks, uh, that has the same name as this Drupal.org module has an update on Drupal.org and try to update your feature with this module from Drupal.org. That happens with update uh, with namespace collisions, and it really messes things up, really, really badly. So, yeah, because it, Drupal's trying to update your module to something that's not it. So just bear that in mind. Uh, this is kind of the, this is the how to do deployments with features. Now remember, all your deployments should be repeatable, automated, and testable. So if you're doing proper deployments. I don't know if you saw the talks on continuous integration, continuous deployments. I definitely uh, recommend going online and watching the screencast for those afterwards. But remember, repeatable, automated, testable, this works well with features. So you should always have update hooks in your features. So if you're doing things uh, you know, that require data be, to be moved around, do it in an update hook. Get it so that you can just run update.php and have features do all of the manual stuff for you. So if you're not using something like boxes or beans for your, uh, for your, uh, you know, for your uh, blocks and your management of those, you can utilize this to manage where your uh, your block placement. Um, remember, features are modules, so do module-like things with your features. Another thing that you should be doing in your uh, in your features is so you can use uh, you can utilize things like a display suite or panels to try to get things laid out. You could also use features uh, use the dot module file to put your uh, to put your custom display modes into your dot module file and your you know your fields you know, your extra fields in there so you've got your pseudo fields and you've got all that stuff in your feature for whatever content type it is and all that stuff is managed in one place. And that's, yeah, when you're do, using features, don't think of it necessarily in terms of this is a blogging feature. Think of it in terms of this is my piece of this, my piece of configuration, groups of configuration, because that's what it should be. What else do I have in here? Oh, soft dependencies. This is a huge one, in my opinion. You don't utilize the dependency uh, in your info hook if you, unless it's a absolute concrete dependency. If, if, uh, if disabling that module doesn't actually break anything, it shouldn't be in your dependency in your info file. It should be a soft module dependency such as this one that will install in your, uh, that'll, you know, when you use your uh, .install file, your install hook, use module enable to enable that module. Plupload is a great example of this because eventually they might say, hey, can you turn off plupload in this? Well, rather than going through and creating a feature that'll go through and just like and pull all that stuff out, it'd be great to just disable the Pluplode module because that'll get rid of all of that and it won't break anything. If you so, if you do that, then you can turn off all those, uh, turn off that setting, keep all of your features, you know, really the way they are because none of because those settings aren't going to matter if the Pluplode is turned off. 
So you can uh, then utilize a soft dependency. You can still disable these modules if it's a soft dependency. If it's a hard dependency in your .info file, that module is locked in the on position. You can't turn it off unless you update your feature to have that, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that your info file, take it out of that dependency, and get it pulled out like that. So utilize, your, uh, utilize soft dependencies. And there's really more to it. As you go through and you, you, know, and you use features more, uh, these are things that you'll really kind of grasp, and you'll get your own workflow for a lot of these things as well. Now, this is how features will abandon you. So features has a lot of little things that will really tick you off. So I had to talk long enough for everybody to watch that, that GIF because it's just epic. So, yeah. So remember, features will abandon you. It's going to happen. And this, it'll happen for these key reasons right here. It's too good to be true. It's too dumb to be helpful. It doesn't keep track of things. It doesn't keep track of changes. And not everything supports features. And features is really, really buggy. Really buggy. It will, uh, yeah, yeah. I recommend enabling your features early on, make your changes, commit those changes, and continue on. But features is, is, is very buggy. So if you're doing this thing, that's why in, the, in that workflow, up, you know, always back up your database before, this, uh, before exporting and enabling features. The, and any time you enable a feature, think of it as a deployment. And this matters on your dev, on your stage, and on your production. Think of it as an actual deployment because it's really going to go through and it's really going to do things. And if you're using, say, backup and migrates to back up your data and you're expecting backup and migrates to work well with features because you're backing this up and you're going to try to restore with a backup from uh, backup and migrate. Backup, re uh, always remember, backup and migrate will copy your entire database, every table in your database, and then it will restore all of the tables that it backed up. Well, that comes into issue if you are restoring after you've, cre after you're, let's say, you've enabled a feature and everything broke, so you're going to try to restore after that. Well, that feature that's, uh, that's enabling, uh, you know, it, it, ha it created these tables. These tables are now in your database. Nowhere in Backup and Migrate's workflow does it empty the database of any tables. So you've got these tables. Drupal doesn't even know that these tables are there anymore because you've restored from Backup and Migrate. So now you have all these tables that you're, uh, that's your, say for your fields, your field data and your field revisions tables. Those are in there and you try to enable that feature again and features comes back with a PDO of section, uh, uh, exception and is in a permanent rebuilding status for your feature because Backup and Migrate isn't cleaning things out before, your, uh, before restoration. So you, you know, there are code snippets out there that you, need to, uh, that you need to do to get that done. Another thing features does not do for you is disable or delete fields. So if you've got a, an old field, say you initially had it set up for your user profile to have a middle initial, and now your, uh, your client says, oh, I want a middle name. So, okay, great, I'll put the middle name field in there, and I'll remove that middle initial field. And then everything will be great because nobody was using middle initial field anyway, so nobody's, there's not going to be any loss of data. Well, you go to deploy that, that middle initial field will still be there. You have to manually go, uh, manually go in on the update hook and tell it to get rid of that, uh, that field because it's still there. And so features does not do these things for you. It doesn't manage all that stuff. It, you have to do it, and you have to remember, you are the developer, and you are smarter than features, and you will make features do what features is supposed to do for you, and so this is about making features work for you. You need to get in there and get it done. Now, here's uh, kind of the, the, uh, the, the new thing, features in Drupal 8. Drupal 8 has a configuration management system, so why do you need features? Well, the reason you need features in Drupal 8 is because your configuration management system, all of your configuration is signed for that site. So those, uh, the configuration, technically, you can export it, and you can manually go in and strip out those, that line in the YAML file to get rid of that signature so that you can take it into your, other, uh, into your other stuff. Or you can let features do it for you, and that's kind of their idea is features in Drupal 8 will take those YAML files for configuration, and it'll export it into reusable chunks so that you can reuse it 
use it as like a stem for whatever module you're going to be doing that would normally set those uh, those configurations and things. All right, questions? Yes. How did you make a soft dependency again? Is that in a it's a uh, it's a API call for Drupal called module enable. So you pass an array of whatever of all the modules you want to enable. In that case, it was just one, but uh, it's a soft dependency because it enables it on that update hook. But it's a uh, but it's soft, so you can disable it after. It's not yes. Really creating a, a dependency per se. It's enabling the module. Well, you, uh, you, the idea is you wouldn't do that unless your feature was dependent on that in some way. Yes? So if you've got a feature that, you know, you, you require a module of dependency, um, and you want to disable that module, you, you don't need a local box, but are you saying that you should be using update hooks to make a call to module disable? No, not module disable. So the question is, why uh, why put that in there if you're gonna if you could just put it into a uh, into your modules.info file? I'm gonna repeat some of the stuff a little bit because I just realized this is being recorded and my computer's microphone is never gonna be able to hear what you guys have said. So, so my question really was that: How do you uh, how do you go about disabling a module in production that's required in the feature? Mm -hmm. So you just uncheck it in the feature and employ it again. It's not yeah, you could do it the same way with an update hook. It's really the way that you should do it. Yeah, because again, you're you know, you're talking about deploying with features. You don't want to have to go through and uh, you know on the sites and do a bunch of stuff manually. You want to make sure that your features are doing this for you, which means putting it into your update hooks or writing a deploy module or deploy script that will do this stuff for you. So. Uh, the kind of the recommended uh, recommended purpose uh, or idea with that would be to actually use a deploy module. So you'd have a separate module that would be like prefix underscore deploy, and then have you know a lot of your configuration go into that stuff that wouldn't necessarily you wouldn't really want it in your feature anyway. So remember features you want to bundle that uh, that configuration together in your deploy. Uh, yeah, so in your deployments would be yeah doing that stuff for you uh, if you want to use a deploy module. Mm-hmm. Yes. So as you said, features are modules themselves, and I've found that you know ninety-nine percent of custom modules that I have on my site are actually features right. so which I have other coding and stuff like that. So given all that, why segment them off into a features directory? Well, it's really to kind of because these are the things that you built yourself. It's uh, the the idea being that these are this is where my configuration is going. You could have it just in your custom modules directory. It depends on really what it's doing. As soon as your feature becomes more of a custom module, then yeah, it shouldn't be in your features module or your features directory anymore. But it, there's you know there is a, cl a cut line there where it's a feature because it's just really managing configuration. And then all of a sudden it gets past that, and now it's managing all this extra custom stuff, and it's really a custom <coughs> module that happens to contain a feature. Um, I ran into an issue with field instances and being in a state where they're rebuilding all the time. Did mm -hmm. you get called in the process, or was the cache clear? So what you'd want to do, that's, there's, a, uh, there's a variable. I'm trying to remember exactly what the name of it is. It's something really, uh, uh, there's a certain variable that you need to uh, unset, basically, or delete. And so that'll tell it to re-go through and, and, uh, and look at it. It's called like uh, sim something. Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. But you need to go through and delete that variable. And uh, it's a variable that uh, that feature set, and it basically contains an array of like what's going on. And so what ends up happening if you've got a feature that's stuck rebuilding, it's going through and it can't get through the rebuild because the feature isn't finished enabling. So that uh, because it's not finished enabling, it can't actually rebuild. So it'll always say rebuilding. And this is one of those broken promise things with features. It'll say, yeah, it, it'll go through and it's tell you it's managing this stuff, but at this point. You've cleared the cache several times. It still says rebuilding. There's no other recourse that you have really than doing a variable, you know, a variable delete in that case, or a variable set to an empty array of that uh, of that variable. I noticed that running cron helps though. Well, it depends on what uh, on what the purpose is, uh, or like what's causing it to break on rebuild. 
uh, most uh, most times very uh, it, it'll just be stuck in rebuilding. If it, if you see rebuilding, oftentimes it's just stuck in rebuilding. Um, but you know, from time to time, it actually does take a couple yeah you know, a couple times through for that feature to actually rebuild completely. Any other questions? Yes. What did you have against the, uh, the, the features experts and blocks and all that stuff? Is there anything particular that you don't like about that? Uh, the question is, uh, what do I have against all those features extra blocks and all those modules? Um, the main thing that it, it all depends on what it's doing. So if your features extra module is, uh, yeah, is doing block management, then that's okay to me if it works. If your features is trying to stage content or stage users or keep track of taxonomy terms, that's an issue because of, uh, because of the node IDs and the user IDs and the term IDs. So if you're managing all that stuff, you can't rely on anything. So what would the point in putting that into a feature be? All right, we're pretty much done with where I'm supposed to be. And I think the next presenter is now waiting for me to No. <laughs> well, I know that I have a, another talk in another room here, so any more questions? All right, thank you very much. Mm-hmm.